I promise it. I promise it is going to go live. <laughs> Okay, cool. I think we are. They've changed it since the last time that I did this, which was two weeks ago. So that's really fun. Okay, I think we are live. Melissa, text me if we are. <laughs> All right, we're just gonna, we're just gonna go for it. Um, all right, so thank you everyone for joining us today for our um, second in our Facebook Live series sponsored by Verizon. Uh, today we're talking about uh, handball development in the, uh, in the United States, um, and we have a really exciting panel to talk about that with. So um, from the USOPC, we have Chris Snyder, who's the Director of Coaching Education and Coaching at the USOPC, and Kenzie Koning, who is the um, Coordinator for Coaching Education and the Athlete Development Model. Uh, thank you guys both so much for joining us today. Uh, they also worked with me and my team over the summer to develop our athlete development model, which has not launched yet, but we're hoping to get it out in the next, in the near future. Uh, I won't put a date on it, so no one's emailing me next week with it. Um, and then from USA Team Handball, we have Julio Sands, who is the, who is an IHF master coach and um, the coach of the U.S. National Junior Men's Team. Um, and we also have Craig Rote, who is on the IHF International Handball Federation um, Handball in School Working Group and is also the um, junior women's national team head coach. Uh, so thank you guys for being here and thank you guys for your years of uh, developing our, our young athletes. So just to kick it off, I kind of wanted to just get a little background on Craig and Julio, your experience as coaches and kind of your approach to developing handball athletes from a young age. So we'll start with you, Craig. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, like I said, I'm like uh, uh, Emily said, I'm Craig Rote. I'm a women's national team coach. Uh, after eight years on the men's side, I've now switched over to the women's side last year and Excitedly looking forward to this new opportunity to develop athletes. Um, my background is that uh, in developing handball programming for the IHF and for the USA in mini handball and early developmental levels in middle school and high school. Um, my approach to developing athletes has always been a game-based approach, which means I prefer to have a very well-structured um, progressive exercises that tend to develop multiple skills at once instead of a drill based uh, background that has kids stand in line and wait to perform a single technical or tactical skill. Um, I prefer to, uh, I always say, I, I prefer to train kids that with increasing intensity and uh, speed, um, meaning that I, I demand more of them and ask them to do it at a faster rate as they develop, which makes them more proficient and ready to handle the speed of the game that we see. And that's been my basic approach. And uh, as the first youth men's team to compete international, head coach to compete internationally, and now last year, the first women's youth team to compete international, it's very exciting to see your program come to fruition and see your players really excel on the international stage. So that's my basic beliefs. Awesome. And Julio, same question. Um, I'm on the uh, same lines of, of, of Craig as, as well. I, um, I do believe in uh, early development. Uh, I feel that um, uh, the sport has to, you know, be developed at, at, a, at, a, at an age where um, the athletes, the children in general, can actually find uh, a, a ludic, you know, a, a, a joy um, to um, to as a component of 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 the playing the sport, and obviously progressively um, jumping into uh, the stages of development uh, of the sport. Um, just like Craig said at the beginning, you know, you want to make sure that. Um, you cover um, the basics, 
uh, you start develop, developing the basic individual skills. From there, it, it actually promotes or progresses to uh, collaboration. And once you start actually getting to the more, compl more complex uh, stuff, then you, know, you start thinking about um, game situations and stuff like that. And um, you know, eventually try to uh, develop the athletes for a recreational, um, um, or high performing um, development. But at the end of the day, um, what's important is, is the, uh, the, uh, the ludic part of the game or the development, you know, where the, the children are playing for, um, you know, as a, as a way to um, practice a different sport, sport that perhaps is not as, as traditional as the one that they all know. Awesome. Yeah, that's great to hear. So now to throw it to um, Chris and Kenzie, uh, probably a lot of our viewers don't actually know what the athlete development model is. Um, it's a word that we obviously all hear all the time in, in our line of work, but as a casual fan or, you know, a recreational player, you might not know about it. So do you guys just want to go over kind of like what the athlete development model is and what this purpose is and like kind of how it fits into like the broader spectrum of sport. Yeah, happy to. And it's nice to see everybody. Um, excited to be around handball nerds uh, on this. I've gotten my butt kicked a few times over at the Air Force Academy, only being five foot six and realizing, man, this is really a tall person sport at times. Um, but I've been happy to uh, block low on certain people. Um, but yeah, it's been a, a lot of fun when I get a chance to get out and play. Uh, a lot of respect for uh, what Craig and, and Julio teach others to do on a regular basis and the athleticism it takes to get up and down the field. And, you know, as a whole, I think in the United States, one of the biggest things for us is, you know, we have a lot of athletes and, you know, sport is something that's inherent to us. The issue we started to see though, was that a ton of kids were dropping out of organized sport and we were starting to actually have to work harder to train overall athleticism and transferable uh, athleticism between our athletes. Kids were starting to play just one sport from, you know, starting very young and paying lots of money to actually not get developed as a whole athlete. And it was hurting as kids started to experiment and try different sports. And if you were even able to go multi-sport, overuse injuries were on the rise. So back in like 2014, we started to say, if we don't do something, we're gonna be in a bad spot. And the American athlete is, we're getting worse, not just athletically, but the technical tactical skills you need to learn and develop first before you can really compete hardcore later weren't being developed. So we started to, you know, much like Craig and Julio talked about of really they're saying, you know, hey, we're, we're games based or development first. Let's get you learning a lot of different things. We'll perfect you as time go on, but we need you to be able to just move and think on your feet. That's what we really need our athletes to do to be great, no matter what, just for fun, for performance, for elite success or life. We all just want to have a good time, but know how to play. And so we can kind of match it up with our abilities. So in 2014, we said, you know, enough's enough. Kids are dropping out left and right. About 70% of females were dropping out of organized sport by the age of 13, 60% by the age of 12 for boys. And that's not good for business. So we said we need to do something about it, but we need to build a better athlete and a better system that can grow sport excellence. So we call our athletic development model the American development model. Uh, Canada, the UK, they use long-term athlete development concepts, which is you look at the athlete like a child and as they grow, we teach them different things at different levels. And if you can start them with a great foundational base and they become lifelong learners, you're eventually going to be able to progress them into greatness. Well, we couldn't just rip off stuff from Canada or the UK and, and feel American because we're snobby like that. So that's why we had to call it the ADM. And uh, you know, lots of American flags and red, white, and blue everywhere. But the concepts are kind of universal. I mean, we want every kid to play and don't cut. As long as you can, don't cut. If he stinks or she stinks, keep her in the game, playing longer because if she plays it for life and you can have a B division, a C division, and she loves it, that's a generation when they have children that they're going to keep in that sport, or maybe they become coaches or officials or a rich person that gives you money. So sending people away in sport is a horrible idea. 
And that was kind of the first step. You got to retain everybody. Find a place for them to play. The other thing is, yes, I thought I might be taller. I turned out to be 5'6". But if you cut me early, I was a little tall early in life and just didn't grow after I found wrestling and, you know, stunts your growth. It's bad for health. Um, but the big thing is you cut kids early, all of a sudden they hit a huge growth spurt. And this person who's 6'2 could be a stud for you in the middle. I mean, you don't want to cut them early because you never know what they might develop growth wise to be or athletically. So it's a concept. The next thing was we really want to go ahead and have our athletes learning developmentally appropriate skills. We want to go ahead and make sure that they're doing lots of multiple sports because it makes a well-rounded athlete. And you can, especially in the sport like handball, you can pull from American sports like lacrosse, basketball, um, and quite a few other things of getting up and down the field, even ultimate frisbee, ways that you can learn to get up and down the field and cross train for handball. Um, and God forbid you go out to the beach and now you need to learn how to actually get your feet in the sand uh, and be able to move. Like you need that multi-sport approach to things. So that's a concept in there. And then we really know that you need to have overall physical movement literacy and be able to handle the load and you have to have great coaching. And we really look at this as a coach-driven approach where if you're athlete-centric but coach-driven and your coaches know how to progress you as you develop as an athlete, as well as a handball athlete, as well as ask you or look at you and say, you'd be great at performance. You may not make it, so participation is your place, but we still want to find a way for you to love the sport. Those concepts are what we've been trying to get national governing bodies to wrap together into a package to then go out after our American athletes at any age and get them to come in, love playing, fun first, games-based methods like Craig was talking about, you know, development first like Julio talked about. And if you lead with that, you can now retain them to build them into elite athletes. But our big point, and I'll let Kenzie maybe talk about some of the key things she's seen across, uh, there's about 28 sports that have adopted this concept to try to build it in their area. Uh, heavy hitters like golf, football, tennis, uh, lacrosse, all have models. Handball is one that's coming in when uh, Emily and the team start to release it. And I know Julio and Craig have had a uh, big influence on that, but man, I'll tell you what, it's the kind of thing where we got to get back to our roots of what makes sport fun and having a chance to play and being able to be successful while being challenged is a reason why kids play sports. So Ken's anything you want to say just about some of the key things you think uh, make a great ADM program or concepts that everybody seems to uh, circle around? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you guys again for having us. This is really cool for us. Um, we geek out on ADM because uh, we get to work in that day to day. So we love speaking to it. But yeah, Chris mentioned some of the heavy hitters. We have very big sports that have or are in the process of developing ADM. But that's not to say that it is not for all sports in the sense that you can be a developing sport and adopt ADM and continue to work through it um, to see benefit in programming. Um, with that, Chris touched on it a bit, but multi-sport activity is huge. Uh, it's something that is a big part of ADM and something that we really strongly encourage of all sports. You know, uh, it can be done through programming, uh, partnerships, even just like collaboration opportunities with other sports. Um, but the reason being is the more opportunity a kiddo has, like Chris says, to interact with and try out multiple sports, the greater opportunity to limit that early specialization um, and potential burnout. So super big on multi-sport activity. Um, and so for a developing team like hand or a developing sport like team handball, I think it's especially critical, right? Because it in nature, it's a crossover sport, you know, team handball takes similar plays um, as many other sports, you know, you get up and down the court, similar to basketball, you jump up and shoot similar to lacrosse, um, sometimes physical contact, you know, like hockey. So um, there's really a unique opportunity here, I think, to kind of cross pollinate and focus on being that crossover sport um, and grabbing those kids that are dropping out or are being cut from other sports. Um, and then too, Chris mentioned fun. That's a huge part of ADM. Um, obviously we wanna bring the fun back to sport um, while still competing, still you know having natural progression, but um, ADM does provide that opportunity to bring and put focus to the fun um, and make experiences that 
once kiddos are exposed to handball, they stick around, right? Because they just love the game and they're having such a good experience. So um, I think with that growing the pool of quality coaches um, and experience is definitely important. Um, we know coaches are the closest point of contact to athletes. They have the greatest influence. Um, so putting focus to coach development through ADM programming um, to make great coaches that will make great experiences um, for their athletes where they love the game and stick in it. Uh, I think that's a really uh, critical area for a developing sport like team handball. Awesome. And so I actually, um, obviously I've talked to both Craig, well, I've talked to like everyone on this call several times and about this kind of stuff. And one of the things I wanted to throw this back to you, Craig, in terms of talking about the, that like kind of key age of the like 11 to 14 kind of area and, and the retention then and the importance of introducing athletes to the sport at that age. So do you want to just kind of touch on that off of what Kenzie was just talking about? Yeah. And I, I think I'll attach that also to what Chris said before about the age kids leave sports and the reasons they leave sports. And so I, if I can convince anyone of anything today is to flip how we view this age group athletes. Um, this age group is the golden age for skills development. Um, we hook them in the novice and beginner phases, but this intermediate phase is key. And most people see a young man who has puberty early or a young girl who has puberty early and think, I'm going to win with this person. But we have to kind of change that concept because their golden age is much shorter. I can do less with that early puberty athlete than I can do with a late bloomer. And so most people see that immediate success in this age group, this 11 to 14 age group, and they look for immediate on-court success. And we need to flip that on its end, and we need to, especially at this age group, develop as many people as possible. I mean, we really have to develop as many people as possible and tagging onto what Chris said, about how many people leave the sport. There's so many great athletes that leave the sport, leave all sports because adults are ruining youth sports. At the IHF, when we wrote the book for Handball at School and the Complete Developmental Program, we really focused on this and we make recommendations. No cut. We even say no national championships before puberty because it places such an undue pressure on uh, on immediate success and not long-term success. And so if we wish to have a large group of athletes developing, we have to develop all athletes in this. And we need to take the stress off of the coaches to say, hey, this group, this 11 to 14 group, this is the golden age. I mean, it really is. You can, I love this group. <laughs> Anybody who sat in on my, on, my, on my two IHF lectures for the handball or the Children's Week knows how much I love this age group. They are eager, they are adaptive, and they are receptive to almost everything you do, and they still look at you like a, 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 a figure they want to impress. That changes in high school, and you have to work harder to get them here to do what you want. But it, at the 11 to 14 age group, it's amazing what these kids are not only uh, able to do and willing to do, but their commitment to it. But it has to be fun. The setup has to be fun and we can't lose it. And we have to recognize, I mean, this is where I love ADM concepts, but all the, all the athlete development models aren't the same. There's two development models. There's a boy's model and a girl's model because it's all linked to puberty milestones. And so you really have to see how the girl, what girls have a shorter golden age. They get to puberty sooner. That's why in international competition, their youth is U18 and boys is U19 and their juniors is U20 and boys are U21. Boys develop later. Their sweet spots are different for different uh, uh, milestones within that. And so, so for me, the 11 to 14 age group is really important. I, I, if we could focus our efforts there, we could have huge gains, like huge gains for the sport if we focused our efforts there. Because I always say you corrupt from below. It's hard to find college students that, you, that want to play that haven't played. 
But if you have someone from 12 all the way through to 18, 19, it's really easy. I'm just, I just sent out a couple dozen of them to college this year. My first core group of athletes, uh, young men are now out in the world experience. You know, it stinks that they're going out to college and can't start clubs. It was always my goal, but they started playing when they were 12 and 13 and, and, you know, have gone to Partile Cup with me to Sweden and have done all this stuff. But this age group is, they, I, you can sink your teeth in and they don't leave. As long as you make it a great experience for you, for them, through you, they will stay in the sport. And no matter what sports, because I lose my football players in the fall and I lose my basketball players in the winter and I lose my baseball players in the spring and I don't care. I encourage you. Go play. Go have fun. I need a break from you anyway. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's good for everybody involved. It's, it's good. So I, I just think we really need to look at this as the golden age of development and really give it what it really needs, which is they will, you can do more in five weeks than you can do in five years with an adult. So that's my, that's, yeah, that's great. So, um, you know, to kind of summarize that Craig is, you know, like you're kind of talking about the importance of focusing on develop on, on exposing kids at a younger age to handball would you say like in terms of development of handball on the on the national scale would you say that that's the most important thing oh i would say yes i would exposing all kids to handball is hugely important from my experience parents play a bigger role in grade school age than they do middle school at middle school, parents start to say, well, maybe my son's not going to be LeBron James. <laughs> and so they, they kind of, they're, so I find middle school to be a more receptive area to gain new athletes. It's harder and it, it, it's easier to do it in school. I, my program always focuses on providing mini handball in, the sco in elementary school because it's really hard for me to build programming for that group because of the parents, the, not just the reluctance, but they don't know the sport. But if they have it in the school, they then in middle school, they will come train. But in, but in middle school, there's so much for them to develop with. Like as long as you have, a, like what I've talked about, the game, a game-based approach in which you're really following their developmental milestones, but really interacting with them at the level they want to be. They want to have fun. They want to have excitement. They always laugh at me because even in practice, when we have scrimmages, I lie about the score to keep the game close. They lose track of it. They're like, is it really that? And I'm like, yes, it's that. Because it only matters that they're having fun. And as long as everyone's engaged, they're going to try harder. They're going to play better. They're going to enjoy it more. Even if I have to lie about the score in a, you know, in a late practice scrimmage. Because I'm notorious for it. And I always lie about the time. <laughs> it's interesting. But, it's, but it's important that they enjoy it. By do, you know, it's not, I don't want to be legalistic. I want them to have fun because then they'll stay. If they don't have fun, they're not going to stay. It, it goes for all of us. Sure. Sports, like, like, they, like Chris and Kenzie said, if you can't have fun, why do it? Right. Definitely. All right. So Julio, you're up. What would you say is the most important thing for handball to develop in the United States? It, it, I, I, I will agree with everybody, and, and I go back to what I said when I, when I, start, when I made my first statement. Um, it's, it has to be for fun. Um, and part of it is because, you know, and I'm going to fast forward this to high-performing coaching. You know, you, you have already gone through your, your whole uh, uh, development, and now you're coming to me as a national team coach, you know, and I want to come with all these high-level you know, uh, tactic approach and all that. If you did not develop, you know, when you were a kid, it's going to be really hard to actually, you know, get to what I want you to be once you are at a high performing level. So um, I'm not saying that it cannot be done. It can be done, but it, it will be detrimental. So the importance of two things, fun, okay? Early development at, at early stages, uh, and then uh, progression through through puberty and you know and, and all the developmental stages, and but at the end of the day, there's one thing that I really really ma matters to me in the ADM, which is the humble for life part, because this is um, this is one mistake that I think that we have consistently made 
And part of it is because we want the results. We want the, uh, the media gratification and, you know, and, and the international um, success and all that. So we have only put our mindset on developing um, you know, national team athletes. And, and the truth is we need to develop more humble for live athletes. You know, I see myself as, as a humble for life uh, athlete. I was a humble player when I was a kid. I, I went to the progression and I hit that wall once I got to the junior category, so I, I couldn't play anymore, you know, and part of it is because I wasn't good enough. You know, I wasn't good enough to actually get to the level of competition where you need to be at that age, right? So you can, so you can um, 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 further your career. But then I became a humble for life guy, you know, for life guy. And, you know, I, and I became my development as a, as, a, as, a, as a coach. And today I'm a coach and I'm a really happy coach. Uh, because that's another thing that we need to think about. Development, it, it, it also has to include coaches. You know, if you have really good coaches, you uh, uh, um, proportionally, there will be a proportional relationship to development of good athletes. So, um, you know, I feel that fun will lead to humble for life. You know, falling in love with the sport will, um, you know, um, will take you to a place where, um, you know, you will be a humble fan, a humble uh, uh, parent. A hum I, I always say it, you know, my idea is that I want my grandkids to play handball in the US, not in Spain or in, in Denmark. I want them to be playing handball here. So, you know, it's, that's, that's the foundation of everything. It's like, um, if you don't invest time on those who are going to take you to the tip of the pyramid, uh, we will always will start all uh, starting from zero every three, four, five, six years because that gener golden generation went away. So, um, and, and if you look at the countries who are developed, um, even in a club, just single it, the single this to a club. If you look at a, a, a PSG in, in, in or Barcelona in Spain, you probably have 500 kids playing for that club, and maybe only five will make it to the uh, competition categories and maybe only one will become professional. And maybe that one that became professional was never good enough to represent either Denmark, I mean, France or, or Spain. So the idea is that the more kids we have playing the sport, the easier it will be for us at all level. And uh, we'll create a base where eventually basketball and soccer will be stealing from us rather than us stealing from them because there's a lot of benefits that, you know, Hamble brings in terms of, you know, athletic development that um, because of the nature of the sport, because it's very simple, you need to just run and, 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 and use your natural coordination, you know, uh, I and hand and eye coordination and play it where other sports are more complicated, you know, they're not as natural as Hamble is. And, and you were saying something, uh, Chris, earlier about not growing up. Uh, enough. And, and that's the beauty of handball, that handball is a sport that is developed for the uh, Nikola Karabatic looking athlete and the Chris Snyder looking athlete too. So everybody will have a space in, 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 in this group, you know, um, granted that, you know, you'll have to be fantastic as a 5'6", to actually become professional, but you could. There's Lubomi Branius. There are so many samples of fantastic athletes that, you know, did not have that uh, um, per se um, uh, ideal profile to play the sport, you know. Um, I am a clinician, so I'm always gonna think about motivation, you know, in the formula of performance. And um, for me, I do this for fun, you know, even as a coach, you know, uh, uh, every time that I, that I coach, I, I, it, it brings me back to when I was a little kid, you know, playing the sport with my coaches in my hometown with my friends who are still a friend of mine. So that's the idea, you know, like becoming a humble for life, um, you know, uh, athlete by, by, stay, by starting so early. You know, Craig will say something about elementary versus, you know, uh, uh, you know middle school versus high school. Um, in high school, the chip has sell. You know, they are already in love with whatever the sport it is that, they, that they, they love. I'm not saying that we cannot target those, okay? But the idea is 
that they fall in love and you know when they're 11 and the same way that they fall in love with judo or with basketball or with track and field and said what craig said you know play your entire year whatever the sport it is that that you it is in season but at the end of the day come and come and play humble for me you know what i mean so that's that's my way of of seeing this um very simple awesome so just some themes i've seen through this is obviously we've got the exposing younger people that to handball and then on the other end is making sure that they're they're staying with us for their whole lives and and that we create an inclusive environment um i want to throw it back to chris and kenzie you guys have mentioned that chris mentioned that you guys have worked with 28 sports for the athlete development model. Um, obviously you mentioned some heavy hitters like golf and, and football. We're on the other end of that and I'm sure that you've worked with some other smaller sports. What do you think, what element of the ADM is most important for handball and for other developing sports to focus on first when they're looking to kind of go up to the next level? Yeah, I, I can touch on this one. I kind of covered it a little bit, um, but pretty much, and I'm, I've, it's been unanimous, it seems, with the group, but like fun and coaching. Um, so if you don't have fun, um, kids aren't going to stick with it. And that's the ultimate goal if we want kids to be in a sport for life, whether developing or not. Um, and then great coaching, uh, developing the coaching pool where of quality coaches where um, – you have quality coaches that are able to make those quality experiences that keep kids in the sport longer. Um, and, you know, we know with coaching, like it, it, they are so close to the athletes. Typically um, they are like a super important point of contact. So the fact that coaches have that unique relationship um, and to capitalize it on the sense of just developing them further um, so that they do, have the ability and are equipped to make those quality experience for kiddos. So Chris, if you have anything to add, feel free. Yeah. One of the interesting things that we've worked with other national governing groups on is yeah, that quality coach needs to be able to develop the athlete for sure. But there's a, there's a level of marketing here and there's a level of understanding of parents in the sports system. And I mean, Craig kind of said it of, you know, 11 to 14 is a prime age to sit there and watch other sports that cut kids left and right. You get to junior high basketball and all of a sudden they're going to take 10 kids and cut the other 30 that came out. There's a level of strategy to think about how you're actually going to run your ADM or your system. And that coach needs to be able to grab those kids and bring them in, play to their strengths, but also like be someone who's going to make sure that they're going to make sure those new kids who are just trying this sport are supported, having super, a ton of fun. And then you're telling their parents how great this is going to be for them. And they could go to Sweden and other places if they try this out. And my God, there's opportunities in a college club leagues if they go to certain schools. And all of a sudden you're speaking their language of, oh man, my son just got cut from junior high basketball. And they're saying, wow, I'm super excited. He found something that seems like so much fun that he could get into or she could get into and has opportunities. And that's the biggest thing about handball in the US. Yeah, it's a smaller sport by growth and niche. It's still one of the top team sports in the world. And the moment most of our kids get to step foot in another country, like they're like, oh my God, like netball, what the hell is that? Handball? You can play this on a beach? Like, why are we not playing this on the beach in California or South Carolina? I mean, you can play this anywhere. They, they, their eyes open to the whole world. And many of us on this, I mean, on this call, yeah, we didn't have that access to travel and seeing other worlds. Now our athletes coming up, they do. You can visit it virtually or physically so much cheaper than we could. And now you're seeing that whole world. So the coach has got to be a strategist, a role model for how we want to grow handball in the U.S. and market it to parents, athletes but also that know how to develop them while making sure they have fun. Because my God, I'm going to have you have fun and then I'm going to tell you what you suck at. And I'm going to make sure you keep coming back to get better at that. So you get really good, but still had fun versus saying, guess what? You're cut. We'll see you later. So that strategy is something that we've tried to work to have the rubber meet the road where governing bodies can get real about applying it. And I think that's, what's great about handball. 
you got some opportunity to show a niche sport to some kids and, and get rid of it being niche and to Julio's point, like absolutely. I've been an 18 year coach of the sport of lacrosse at the college level and the high school level. And when we started playing this or, or seeing it, it was like, this is lacrosse on a basketball court. Like this is like, this is five on five, six on six play, moving the ball and shooting coming off picks and other players. And like, this would be great in the off season. And you're right. You know, all of a sudden I'll start stealing your players from our lacrosse programs. So it's, it's good to think, but we got to strategize how to make it happen. Definitely. Um, and so just to kind of tie in our partner Verizon, they've been really focused on the small business element um, during this pandemic. And in a previous conversation, Chris and Craig, you guys kind of talked about how the ADM model is kind of like a, a small business. And just off of what you were just talking about, uh, Chris, in terms of marketing um, and marketing to uh, parents and things like that, I just thought it was a good time to kind of bring that up. So I'll throw it back to Chris to start and then Craig to follow up uh, just on that idea. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, Craig and I had a great discussion of like, yeah, like if you go to start to look at, you know, your, your handball club, as a small business and you're saying, how are we gonna go acquire new customers? And it's literally talking to your athletes of, hey, you got a friend? Or, hey, I heard they make cuts at the local program. You think those kids would wanna play? And starting to think about how you acquire them. But then the biggest thing is retaining. Retention is so much cheaper to do in the business world than recruiting new. So the moment you get an athlete trying handball and as Julio said, you gotta keep these people for life. I mean, that's exactly what Verizon and others try to do. How do I keep you loving what we do by having good customer service, great communication? And when you've got a problem, you can come to us. We'll find a solution and not kind of be jerks about it. If that's what your coaches and your athletes, if you're a role model for that, your small business of the handball club or your affiliation to it as an athlete, you start to take that with pride. I mean, there's a reason why you see a lot of USA on this call. We take pride in the, the team that we represent as a whole. Well, look at your business that way, because I'll tell you what, Gen Z and, and the Gen Alpha that's going to be coming up, they are so brand loyal once they have a cause. And if you give them the cause that is your business, your small business, that is your handball club, they're going to stay with it if you give them great service and get them to love it for life, like Julio said. So, Craig, talk a little bit more about that, because like you get to do this on a regular basis, man. Yeah, uh, it's, it's you... interesting because because the ADM, like as you know, with the, it gives you structure. It gives you something for the families to see. It's not just some strange guy coming out of the woodworks with this sport that no one's heard of. Having an ADM, having to show, having uh, an ADM that you follow and then show successes is really your calling card. It really becomes your calling card. I've developed, I've developed this athlete. I've developed that athlete. When my, you know, my uh, young center back moved up to Julio's team as a, as a 16 year old to compete for the USA on the junior national team, you know, I take honor in that, that that's the player I developed. He's, you know, I can look back and say he was developed, you know, efficiently and successfully. And look, he got to move up three age groups and compete at the junior for the junior national team and and succeed at it and ended up being the starting center back for a while with them and so it's i think the adm is a good in a business sense in a small business sense gives your club direction it gives your program uh, a business case because in the end we have to make the business case for handball anyone that knows me knows i talk endlessly about this you know is as long as we stay in this volunteer realm, we're really going to struggle as a sport until we start making clubs that can then make money to then hire better coaches. Instead of looking for the person who's just available, we're looking for the best person because we've created a small business that can pay for that person. And that, that then improves our coaching stock because more people want to work for you because, hey, I could do it volunteer here or I can get paid there. But to get paid here, I've got to know what the ADM is. I got to know how to develop athletes. I have to have certification. And so it gives structure and competency to your business and allows you to then brand out from there and really make a name for yourself. I mean, I've had my programs, I've had three names in three different areas, but everyone knows my program, you know, that I keep building it, you know. And it's unfortunate with COVID where we ended up because we were going to launch heavily this fall in a revitalized program and now we're waiting, but I'm still gonna open up in two weeks. 
you know, I'm going to do it on a limited scale and see what I can do and see how I can work within the uh, environment we're in, but I'm still looking at a business model, you know? And so because people know that I'm developing their kids and I'm not just showing up, you know, and, and taking their money, I'm, I, they, they're there for the long term, and that's the parents pushing me right now, not me pushing the parents. You know, I have certain parents that contact me endlessly and are like, when are we starting? When are we starting? I want to get started again. I've got another new girl. You know, they're doing the work for me because that's really where it comes down to. When they start doing the work for you, you know you made it. But it's hard work. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm eight years into it. It's hard work. I, we saw pictures of my first program, my first real small program, or my first real young program in Minnesota. And I was looking at it and uh, a coach now, that, or a player from Minnesota team handball, and uh, he was one of my paid coaches there. And I was like, can you believe it's been that long since we ran that program in the St. Paul School District? after school program and it's like it, my world has totally changed but but what's important is i've learned each step of the way and developed it the program to be more business like and to the point now where i'm you know i if, if we could have launched this fall with my new partners we would have been i would have been taking on a salary and so it's we built the business case around it so it's you know that's where we all need to get to we need to be professional we need to be paid we need to create the business case for handball and with an ADM, you, you can do that, in my opinion. Definitely. Um, so just, I think that this is going to be my last question to you guys, and then we'll open it up. Uh, if any of the viewers have any questions, uh, feel free to submit them in the comments, uh, and Melissa will get those to me. Uh, but just, Craig, I know that you have a lot of experience playing other sports. I think everyone here obviously has experience playing other sports, interacting with other sports, whatever. How is team handball different and from a development standpoint? So let's actually start with Julio for this one. Like what, what are the, the cornerstones that make handball a different development model than like a soccer or rugby or something like that? Well, for once, um, and it's funny because I, I went from judo to handball, two different complete sports, uh, two different approaches to training, two different approaches. I mean, completely different sports. Uh, for once, the coordination of the sport, you know, uh, development coordination is it, very important in, in handball. It, um, I think, uh, and, and it, 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 it plays an important role in, in the further development. You know, uh, obviously, you know, I'm assuming that we're getting a little bit more into the uh, specialized work of the sport. You know, uh, uh, um, as Craig mentioned before, and I think it has been the, uh, the entire um, um, uh, idea of this is like, you know, you start playing with, you start training the athletes, but then eventually they're going to start progressing, right? And um, I, I think one of the, the, the most important things uh, to develop in handball is the coordination. And I feel the coordination in, in handball, it's completely different to uh, uh, other sports. You know, the um, perhaps lacrosse because of how um, um, quick and cutting and uh, et cetera is, maybe there's a little bit of, of, of uh, similarities to basketball as well. But uh, think about this, if we're gonna start throwing uh, sports out there, you know, handball will require a little bit of coordination similar to uh, the coordination of, 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 of the approach of volleyball. Obviously, you're jumping, you're jumping high and you're jumping forward. Uh, you're jumping on a stride. Uh, you're running. It's complete anaerobic. Uh, it's quick, quick, uh, fast cuts left and right, uh, attacking to a strong profile, to weak profile. There's a lot of things that, uh, um, you know, you know, made the sport a little bit um, um, uh, different to other sports. On, on top of all that, then you have to develop the disassociation of the, of the, uh, of the uh, upper extremities and lower extremities. With one, you're running. With the other one, you're catching, you're throwing, you're moving around. The, uh, the thinking on the flight, um, the, the, uh, there's um, the, the geography, the physics of the core makes you develop your peripheral vision because it's in a semicircle. So the thinking on the fly, the uh, 
um, the, uh, the psychological flexibility, the uh, 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 excelling under pressure, because this is a contact sport. There's so many factors that that um, requires different development, uh, in which I think uh, makes the sport fantastic, uh, because it's not the same thing to to run and dribble the ball and pass it uh, with almost no contact to dribble past the ball and getting hammered by a 6'4 guy that weighs 300 pounds and out of those 300 pounds, 297 are muscle. So, you know, it's, it's a very fantastic uh, um, technical and tactical development. Awesome. I would say I look, at, I look at handball as unique in one sense because the 80% of handball to develop in the beginning is a very broad generalized development. Running, throwing, passing and catching, uh, shooting, defending with your body, but there's, they're not highly specific skills. You learn the, the non-foundational skills kind of in an order, um, and then they become highly technical. I always say the first 80% of handball is wonderful. It's really difficult that last 20%, what I would consider the elite. As you move from recreational to developmental to elite, that last 20% takes a lot of precision and work and you need a proper foundation. But handball is a unique sport. You can give a lot of that 80% because they're, they basically take very generalized, broad technical and tactical things. But like Julio said, they, it's that speed and the vibrational load make it kind of unique. That's why we teach it at the IHF, the game-based approach, because learning to shoot <laughs> learning to shoot when you're just in a line and learning to shoot with a defender grabbing you or, or in your face are completely different things. And if you get used to just shoot, there's kids that shoot well in line, but under that pressure, they don't shoot well. Well, I don't do the line thing. I only do the want line when we're warming up our arms, you know, and then I still put a moderate amount of pressure on them to give them because you can, if you can't perform it under pressure in handball, you can't do it in the game, which is why the, game-based approach is so effective because everything's under duress, everything's under stress, everything's a competition with it. And so you're learning the technical and tactical aspects and learning to do it in a scaled model. And then when you come out to the court, you understand how to do it. But handball is unique because like when I work with like say split step to dive shot, <laughs> I know there's someone watching this now that knows this, a player that plays on the men's national team and played for me. Well, I used to, he used to start in a chair and have to fight his way out of a chair with me trying to shove him back in it to get to the sidestep to get to the dive shot. And I would fight with, I would fight so hard with him to keep him in that chair and he would fight so hard to get out of it. Cause if you can fight your way out of a chair, anything's possible on the court. And to this day, it's one of his best moves. It's like his, the, for people who know I'm talking about, it's his characteristic move, you know, diving in through the diving in through guys. But he, we worked on it by fighting out of a chair. And so handball's different and unique because of that aspect. But it crosses over to all sports. I have these alternative developmental paths. If I know you're a basketball guy, I word it this way. If I know you're a football guy, here's what I can give you. You know, and I don't say, oh, it's transferable and use these big terms. I say, hey, you're a cornerback in football. And I know one of my guys that just got a scholarship came to me years later and said, you really helped me be a better football player because I had to really learn how to control a person in space and handball. And it helps me out on the football field. He's an undersized player, but he got a college scholarship. He got many. And he got, he got to choose. And, you know, I, I might lose him for a couple more years, but he'll come back to handball. But I think handball's transferable skills are, and the developmental path, because you can pick them up quickly, go a long way towards all sports. Goes a long way towards all sports and make you better in your sport. And I think that's something that we need to market it as. That we're not trying to steal you away. We will share you. And actually at the IHF, we, we wanna, the, the brain develops different pathways through up to 25 for guys, up to 20 for girls. And, it's the more sports you have, the more pathways you have when your brain myelinates later in life and then says, well, I'm no longer in trainer mode. And so the more sports you play, the better athlete you'll be in the end. But there's sweet spots from when we introduce them that create unique neural pathways versus translating. And I use it like a foreign language. 
when you're 25 and learn a foreign language, you'll always translate from a different language. When you learn a foreign language when you're young, you'll think in it. You know, my kids went to a French immersion school and my oldest son who had the most years of it where they only spoke French in school all the way up through seventh grade, eighth grade before we moved here, you know, he used to say, I think in French. You know, for me, I can speak French sort of, but I have to like clumsily take it, oh, what's my English words, what's my French words? And so I think in handball, we can translate it the same way as long as we get them early enough. And if not, we can help them translate it if it's later. So. That is a fantastic analogy. I, I I do agree. You know, and I and I mean I I I went through that. Uh, there's a point where where you are um, um, translating from one to the other, and that's exactly what happens with some of the transplanted athletes. We just we don't start early. Um, you can teach teach them one thing, but then once you start throwing the complicating factors uh, in the game they go back to their back habit. And part of it is just because of that, because that's where naturally they're going to, they're going to regress naturally to what they know. So, um, and, and it's the importance of, of st starting really early, you know? And with all, with all sports, game experience is truly the language. And if they don't have the cumulative game experience from when they're younger, it's hard to have that, you know, two minutes to go in a game, for the USA in a sport I just learned three weeks ago, there's no there's no language that I can tell them to help them through that situation. You know, they're going to make mistakes. They're going to do that. A, a player that had that at 12 and 13 and 14 and even left for five years and comes back and is in that situation, he can go back. She can go back and access that game experience and and the and, and have that pathway take over. But it's hard. It's hard when you get them at 25 to get. You know, we can. We can learn how to translate for them, but they'll never speak it fluently, in my opinion. Science says it. Or oh, you have an accent. <laughs> <laughs> a basket, I have a basketball accent, but it's true. It's true. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's true. It's just, I, I, it's just true. It's how it is. But we don't want to lose that person either. So we got to make programs that help those elite 25 year old athletes get into the right situation. We have to have programs that help the recreational 25 year old athletes have appropriate opportunities for them to play handball. Because handball is, if it proves anything, people play it for life. Look at our national championships. There's teams with 50 year olds playing on the, in the elite level. So it's, from my standpoint, it's important that we recognize that. You know, we, we have to honor both groups. It's hard. Definitely. All right. So we just got a question from Nopal. I apologize if I mispronounce your name, uh, but they asked, um, hold on, let me read it so I get it right. Um, how do you get handball into low income family communities or rural areas? Um, and maybe Kenzie and Chris, do you guys want to start with this from your perspective in terms of getting support into low income sport? in general to low-income areas? Well, yeah, I mean, how, Kenz, you could jump in here of like maybe some examples of where other sports have been creative. What, the reason why, another reason why we didn't want to just call this what the Canadians do or uh, those from Australia and others is there's a real American flair you got to put on things from the marketing side, but uh, you got to be super creative, especially in low-income urban settings. Look, rental time, paying major bucks up front to try something you may not be successful at, good luck. If you can get out and use existing facilities, which is why I kind of think handball's got a shot in a lot of ways, you can be super creative. So the idea of grabbing a basketball court, grabbing a couple field hockey cages, if you're on the East Coast or West Coast, where field hockey is a thing, if you're in the Midwest, great, cool. Grab a, grab a ice hockey cage if there's one laying around or you know, a PVC piped cage. Don't be snobby to think like we have to have the perfect handball set up and field set up in order to get this going because you'll never get it into those communities. If you can go ahead and get some creativity and find a way, much like soccer found futsal or futsal found soccer um, in the US, you know, it's the game that was played in Brazil, you know, with bare feet, you know, futsal small sided. It became street ball, you know, came freestyle soccer where you're literally juggling and doing tricks, and then it can translate to the bigger game. 
that's how you can be really creative and start to think about how if you want to get this into lower income uh, communities, you've got to be able to offer a product that they can walk out, play pickup and, and jive with and use other types of equipment. Then find a way once they start to know what this is to pull them into your more organized setting. That's kind of the fun of it. If you can think outside the box here, you'll be able to grab a lot of areas. And I'll tell you what, so many sports Kenzie and I work with struggle in this space because they can't get outside of their, their own head that baseball has to be played on a diamond that's perfectly groomed. And it's like, dude, we, we play street ball and you gotta hit it past that car to get a single. Like there's all sorts of ways you can get very young, creative, get costs down and get into urban environments to be successful. But you've gotta take your sport down to that level and make it available. A simple solution is go find a whole bunch of money and rich people that wanna help you make it available. <laughs> But you got to get people to go and do that programming. And again, yeah. I think it's easier if you find ways to urbanize the concept, make it available, and then progress them up the food chain. Kenzie, have you seen any sports that have been super creative in any different ways of, you know, anything like that, that, that you know, makes the game smaller or more consumable? Yeah, no, absolutely. Like Chris said, we work with a lot of sports who are finding creative ways. And I think Creativity is key here for sure. And it's gonna look different for every sport. Uh, one that we work with, volleyball, they thought of a super smart approach, you know, like not every kiddo is gonna have access to a court, a net, a standard volleyball. But what they did was find a way to bring the sport to kiddos that did not have that equipment. So they put together like a care package where they would have a string that you could hang up and that would be your your net, and then you work through like a balloon and you can just experience the sport in different ways. Um, and so that was their creative approach. But I think there's definitely an opportunity for handball to do something similar um, with some of those examples that Chris was mentioning, but it, it just comes down to creativity, honestly. And it doesn't have to be perfect. It can be, you know, whatever that looks like, but you can get the sport into the kiddos experiences in a lot of different ways. And one of my favorite, one of, without a doubt, one of my favorite moments is when I'm introducing it at a school or a district and I go into, the, I open up their closet and it, I, I, the whole, my whole key for Team Handball Academy is to take the no away before they're gonna say it. So I have a curriculum, I have equipment if they need it. It's a, I tell them, just run the program, give it back to me. I have extra sets of equipment. But one of my favorite things is going into their equipment room and seeing what they have and translating it to what I already know. So I'll give you an example. Like I have a, a I've developed a awesome game. It's legendary in the, in my professional development days because the teachers get so competitive at it. But it's basically a game with poly spots with a bowling pin on it and a marked area and you have to have this kind of I changed the rules up but you have to knock the pin off the poly spot and run it back without getting tagged by another group with the ball and it becomes legendary there's been half court shots or whatever but sometimes I go into gyms and they don't have or a closet and they don't have the poly spots and the bowling pins like I, I did the national pilot program for middle school at a local middle school out here and they had tees on football and so I just converted the same concept and you had to knock the football off a tee and run it back while people are trying to tag you and trying to do other things. But I, you have to be able to take what they have and take the no away before they're going to say it. I mean, like I've got my shtick down. I go in and I say, I've got five to eight weeks of programming for you. I've got uh, all the other things you need. And so from, from my standpoint, um, it's, it's important. I, I take away all, I, I have the equipment and I have everything you need. I think the key word is, is, is adaptability, being able to adapt to whatever you have. You know, um, um, I, I, I started playing handball when I was nine and I can tell you that the first time that I saw a handball court, indoor handball court, was when I was already like 16, 16 or 17. So from nine to 16, competing and training, I never played in an indoor court. Part of it is because we didn't have one in my, own, in my hometown. So the entire career was done in, in an outdoor court. And, and so many countries around the world, handball is play in other courts. You know, um, it's, it is only the highly developed or, or, or somehow rich countries that have a, a 
uh, indoor core available for handball or the schools that actually have the gyms uh, for the, uh, physical education because of the weather conditions. But the rest of us, you know, we have other courts. And, and one of the things that we can do, and I've been preaching about this for the past 10 years, is ask us, we go and paint the court for you. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> we will do it. It'll, 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 I mean, the cost of painting a handball court is $24. You get the, uh, the, the, the outdoor paint, the roll and everything, it's just $24. So we can actually have something out there for people. Um, so there's exposure for the, for the game as well. Um, we need to give we need to give something back to the community as well. You know, we want a lot from the community, and I think one of the things that we can offer to them is that is the opportunity of getting to know the sport by us providing them with, you know, where to play it, how to play it, you know, what are the ideas like Craig is saying, what what is it that you have in your closet that I can use for you to develop the sport, you know, it, it, it has to be a, a parallel process, a parallel development, you know, and, uh, and I think that's where us, as the brainstorming group have to come out with a, a solid um, plan. And I think the ADM covers it a lot. And I think it's fantastic. We just need to think about those little complicating factors, you know, how can we actually bring this to a place where there's no uh, regulation uh, uh, indoor um, a stadium um, in 200 miles radius. You know what I mean? Um, and I and I like I like um, uh, all those ideas. Awesome. All right. Uh, so that was the only question that we actually received. So we're actually at the end of the session. Um, I'll let you guys say any final words if you want. Um, Craig. You want to start? Craig, you're muted. <laughs> it was telling me I'm muted. <laughs> I, I would say that the most important thing we all can do is just get started. Um, it, you just have to get started. It's it, it, everybody. It, there's always going to be a thousand reasons to say no, not yet. But there's so many awesome things that come from it that I just want to inspire people to get started. You know, I'm working with a whole new group of teachers now that I'm really approaching and trying to, you know, get them to really focus on not just their students' development, but their own development. And I get a lot of that, but I, I want something new in my life. And I just say, just try it. If you don't like it, quit it. There's plenty of teachers out there for me to go after. So if you don't like it, quit it, but try it, you know, and I try to just get them to start because once they start and they have a program that's fun and engaging and kind of enriching for them personally, and it's fun and engaging for their students and keeps them active, it, it kind of, it's a ball rolling down a hill. You know, we all want to say, oh, but at the bottom, we're going to have to push it back up. Yeah, you're going to have to push up a ball up a hill here, a rock, a very big rock sometimes. But most of the time, if I even get a sense of a no from someone, I move to the next one. There's so many people out there looking for something new that I, I just move on. I don't even waste my time. So I just, just keep going, just, just get started. And then, you know, come and ask our advice, you know, how to keep that program, you know, feeding itself. So that's the best I can tell you. Awesome. Julio, final thoughts. Same thing, uh, we need to do it. Uh, we need to believe that we can do it. Um, and we need to develop a lot of handball for life here in the US. Um, it, it's, it's, the, it's the right sport for us. We need to have this sport developed here. And um, the only way that we can do it is if all of us you know, try to do it. So um, that's all I have to say for now. Awesome, Chris, you're up. Um, I was thinking there's, there's three sports people ask me about when I, I travel around the US for what we do. And Kenzie and I get to work with all 55 national governing bodies. And it's bobsled skeleton. People want to hear about curling and handball. Those are the three that they've somehow seen on ESPN, the Ocho, and are like, why don't we play that? And then you're like, actually, you could actually try handball. You just got to Google search the clubs and it's super fun. So I think you all, I know you all, have a great product that you can get in front of the next generation and the current generation. The key is just, I would think one more. Can I get one more kid to see this, one more parent 
to understand the process. And if you just think a process of one more, it's going to grow like wildfire and, and kind of looking, looking forward to it. Cause I truly believe what Julio said. If I would have found the sport earlier, there would be a place for a five foot six kid. Wouldn't be on the national team, you know, but I, I'd be excited to continue to play and uh, be a part of it. So go forth, be brilliant. And thanks. Uh, yeah. Awesome. All right, Kenzie, you're up. Man, that was pretty good. I feel like we could just end on that. But uh, <laughs> no, I would, I would just echo what they have said, but towards an ADM perspective. Um, you, you can't wait for perfect when developing ADM to actually institute what you have. Even if you have one component, but you can make that one component super, super good, implement it. Get it, in the, get it on the ground, get it working, because your community will inform you like what needs to change and how you can further develop it. So I guess lean into that and don't wait for the entirety of every single component of ADM to be there because you'll, you'll see success even with a start. Awesome. Um, all right, so thank you all so much for joining. Uh, special thanks to Kenzie and Chris for joining from the USOPC. Uh, it was great to have you guys on. Um, and obviously, Craig and Julio. Um, always, a, always a pleasure to talk to you guys. I also just wanted to shout out um, Mary Elizabeth Ward and Sophie Fella, who actually did a lot of the heavy lifting on the ADM over the summer. We're really excited to share that with you once we put on the final touches. Um, they did an amazing, amazing job. And we owe a lot to them and obviously to the, to the four people on this call. Uh, the next one of our Facebook Live series is going to be on October 22nd at the same time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, so be sure to tune into that. Uh, Melissa will be the host of that one. So you'll get to not hear my voice for a little while. Uh, again, thank you all so, so much for joining. Um, and I really appreciate this conversation. All right. Oh, I stopped the live. Ah, stopped it. <laughs> uh.